everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today. So I thought I'd actually go and show you some of my recent pickups at the Rich Altman Boston show uh, and a few other pickups from the mail and maybe some history as well and uh, kind of talk about the ball players and, and whatever else may come. And, and the thing is, I'm just going to keep this uh, really unscripted. The last video I showed you guys uh, was of the Altman show and it was all photographs and one of the things that I really had some questions on uh, were multiples of high-end vintage that really surprised me. I've seen this in the past uh, you know like um, for example I, I you know I have a, a couple of photos somewhere floating around of uh, seven or eight 1952 tops Mickey Mantles uh, in some of the photos I showed you guys uh, there was I think uh, you know a dozen or so uh, 1979 tops or OPG uh, of uh, Wayne Gretzky's rookie you got um, multiples of 1933 Gaudi Beirut or T205 uh, Ty Cobb you know, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you, you know, and, and a lot of these cards are just, they're high end and they're expensive. Uh, you, you know, Ty Cobb's cards usually go between $3,000. They'll start out at 3000 uh, now. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go up to, you know, five, six, seven thousand. And, and it depends on the card, but generally you know, that's the case. Uh, you, you know, Babe Ruth, the same thing, 1933 Gaudi Babe Ruth. You know, I've seen four or five of these cards in one case. And um, it, it makes me wonder how this is happening. Um, you know, even prior to the uh, pandemic, uh, I, I've seen this happen. And um, the, the one thing that, I've, you know, I will tell you guys, if you're collecting 1950s vintage baseball, uh, and especially the, the football is these cards are not rare um, it's usually I think maybe for the for a lot of these cards it's the stories behind them uh, that have pumped up the value and obviously it's the want factor right um, <laughs> you know Mickey Mantle obviously is is a preferred card but um, to what extent is his cards rare? You know, in 1956 tops, not a rare card. Uh, even your 1952 tops high numbers, they're not rare. These these cards are not rare, um, especially the uh, the Hall of Famers. The, well, the guys who are now in the Hall of Fame, your su your superstar ball players, are usually the ones that are being printed in um, higher quantities, and it's. Uh, you, you guys like say uh, Dave Hoskins or Les Mann or um, I, I don't know uh, uh, you know pick your pick your low level ball player of, of any sport those are the guys uh, who are going to be um, printed less you know uh, Oil Smith for the for the page, uh, for the Pittsburgh Pirates you, you know. He he's interesting because uh, he's in the 1928 F50 set, and there's a green tint variation to that card that is exceedingly rare. Uh, so it's usually you know your your cards like that, and uh, you also see this in the 1933 uh, George C. Miller set, right? Um, or or even uh, there's another there's another set too from the you know, the 1930s are really kind of an interesting uh, decade for cards, card rarity. Um, it, it's it's usually never your Babe Ruth cards that are, are going to be rare, uh, especially in the 1930s. But uh, I, I have noticed, you know, in the 1950s, these cards aren't rare, and it's, it's usually your, your superstars that you see the most of. Um, and... and uh, you know, I'm not knocking superstar ball players or collecting them in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you guys 
you guys collect what you want. I will never tell you not to collect a card. Um, I I really kind of enjoy uh, talking about your your average ball players or your superstars or your stars that are forgotten today. Um, and and I'm not the only one doing this. Uh, Chris from Stories in Cardboard, uh, he's got a great site as well, and uh, he often talks about uh, a lot of the players that um, have been forgotten over time. And um, if you guys haven't gone over to his uh, channel, go and give him a, a like and subscribe. Uh, and I think you're really going to enjoy what he has to say about a lot of these uh, cards, especially football too. So I, I'm not terribly familiar with uh, a lot of your, your football players from the 1950s. Um, and uh, if I, if I want to find out uh, more about those guys, I'll go over to Chris's channel. Uh, if I'm, really interested in knowing more about modern ball players. I know exactly who to go to and I'm going to go over and check out uh, Dakota from Sports Cards Anonymous or uh, Dustin from the uh, person, not the personal finance dad, I keep on saying that. Ah. Uh, Dustin, the sports card dad, uh, he's, you know, both those guys have great channels and you know, if you haven't seen them uh, or gone over to their channels, go give them a like and subscribe as well. You know, one of the things I really kind of enjoy doing is just kind of promoting other people in the hobby and, and ball players and, and history as well. And uh, you know, some some of these uh, ball players are really kind of have been forgotten about, and so um, it's uh, really kind of interesting. Um, that when I go on uh, YouTube and I look for uh, vintage content, there's not a whole lot of it out there. There's collectors uh, talking about uh, your average everyday vintage ball player, or even sometimes uh, your star ball players. Um, I, I see a lot of modern stuff out there, and, and there's nothing wrong with this at all. Uh, it, it's you know I, I do learn from it, and I learn from a lot from the the uh, other content creators out there. I, I've always felt that it, it's been very important to be well-rounded in, in anything that you do. Um, no, you know, if it's if it's in your own industry or if uh, you're a collector, uh, you should still learn. Even if you're not collecting vintage, you should still learn about it. And um, it, you know, one of the dealers that I uh, was talking to. Uh, at the Altman show, I asked him, I'm like, you know, is that kind of interesting uh, how some of these cards are printed? And he said no. And I, I was kind of taken aback by that because um, you should have at least a rudimentary uh, understanding of how these cards are printed. Now, uh, there's a lot of modern stuff that I'm very interested in in how this stuff is printed. I have no idea. Uh, printing technology has really um, gotten better over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, and and I, I, I'm always fascinated. Uh, one of the cards that uh, I saw on Dakota's channel a, a while ago now was uh, a, a rookie card of Kurt Warner, which I had actually picked up. And before that, I hadn't picked up a card since 19, a, a modern card since 1994. Um, this has really kind of opened a, a, a different door for me, being a vintage collector. You know, prior to 1994, um, I, I was a quote-unquote modern collector. A, uh, you know, these cards are now, I guess, vintage, which uh, makes me feel very old. But um, I stopped collecting modern cards during the 1994 players' strike. I just got so angry with the players. And, and the owners that I, I said, nope, that's it, no more, no moss. And I went to vintage and I stayed pretty much in vintage uh, up until I saw Dakota uh, showing off some of his, his recent pickups. And and he's he's got some really interesting cards that I, I have never seen before and ball players that I've never even seen before. Because for me, there's a this 20 year gap of uh, missing sports history and 
you know, I, I get to I, I get to kind of figure out who these ball players are. I think, you know, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't know who the Danian Tomlinson is. I, I've never seen him play as far as I know. Uh, I did see uh, Tom Brady play. I did see some of, you know, the Patriots, um, you know, especially when they were going for the Super Bowls in 2001 and I think 2003. Um, you, you know, there's so many of them. Uh, but for the most part, I didn't see any baseball. I still haven't seen any baseball. And baseball for me is, um, it, it is an awesome sport. I do love baseball. I just don't like to watch the game. Now, um, I, I did pick up a recent card of Miguel Cabrera. I've never seen Miguel Cabrera play either. I know he just got 3,000 hits. And uh, he'll probably get in the Hall of Fame. But uh, I couldn't tell you what year this was or even really kind of what card this is. Now, it, it, Gallery of Stars is uh, traditionally, I think it's a, a Don Russ uh, card, uh, kind of similar to your Diamond Kings. And uh, I had to look at the back of this stupid thing. And uh, the, the first thing I see at the bottom is very tiny uh, print. And, um, you, you know, uh, the, the one thing um, about uh, advertising is that you want uh, whatever you're trying to convey uh, in a, a font that is clear and crisp and a design that is clear and crisp. Now, um, let me see. I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you. So this actually, this is the same. This is the same. Basically, it's the same card um, as the Cabrera in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's the same. It's the same format, really. At least I think it is. I can't. Again, I can't tell uh, what this. I can't tell what this card is. Um, I had to look in the back, and the the print is very very tiny. I that like I really need glasses. Um, the design, I, I like the design, and and then, uh, yep, yeah, here's a, another one of Otani as well, and I'm very curious to see uh, what Otani does in his career, uh, in the next ten or fifteen years if, if he lasts that long, and I'm not sure. Um, he he kind of reminds me of uh, Babe Ruth, or uh, Dave Hoskins of the Indians. Uh, Dave Hoskins was a, a Negro League ball player, and he played with the Indians. He's got a 1955 tops, uh, and I believe a 1954 tops as well. I think he's represented on that one. Um, he, he was a pitcher and a, um, an outfielder, and uh, obviously um, the most famous pitcher and outfielder was Babe Ruth. And uh, Babe Ruth actually pitched until 1933. I think he pitched in, in 1920 and uh, again, 1933 and maybe a few games or innings in between, you know, and even, you know, that's not, not really unusual for uh, ball, you know, outfielders to um, be, be pitchers. Ted Williams pitched, I think a few innings in 1940. Uh, Jimmy Fox, I think he pitched even uh, a, a, an inning or two. But um, the guys I just kind of mentioned, you know, Dave Hoskins uh, pitched regularly. And um, I, I even think there was a lot of uh, Negro League ball players that were uh, outfielders and pitchers as well. Um, but <laughs> getting back to some of this modern stuff here, uh, modern is really kind of interesting. I, I don't collect a whole lot of it. I do have some just because of the artwork and um and another set that I, I really kind of enjoy is the 2002 uh, Don Russ Gridiron Kings. And, uh, you know, this is LaDainian Tomlinson. And, and I love the artwork. And it's one of the reasons that has drawn me into uh, this particular set is the artwork. And it's a, a great way to collect um, Hall of Famers on the cheap. And uh, it, it kind of reminds me, too, that... Um, you can collect cards at any age, and it doesn't have to be an expensive hobby, and that's that's what this kind of represents to me as well. Um, the interesting thing is uh, the artists are usually um, have a little bit of a bio on the back of the cards, 
what really is kind of, I think, a drawback uh, for me uh, as a designer as an, and as an artist is uh, this right here. Um, the, uh, the, the wording itself, uh, the text is really kind of too small. Um, th these cards can be off center quite a bit too. And, and I think you're seeing, or there's a lot of complaints these days that a lot of the, the cards uh, that are, are being issued in say like 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, 22 are uh, being found off center. And the quality is really kind of going downhill, uh, which is really kind of surprising to me considering the way that some of these cards are are printed, uh, this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> and I, I think um, that's kind of a, a universal tiff with a lot of uh, modern collectors these days. Uh, you would really kind of expect uh, cards, say like uh, this, for instance, uh, this is a T205 uh, of uh, Eddie Seacott. And I'm gonna get into this particular card in a minute, uh, you would expect that a card like this to uh, to have a lot of defects and uh, really not cards like this right here. Um, I'm really kind of uh, interested in how that occurs and why that occurs. Um, maybe uh, you could really kind of explain uh, the cards um, or understand that you know the cards being printed in 2020 would be um, having a lot of defects uh, because of the lockdowns and whatever else. But um, it's it's really kind of a mystery as, as to why a lot of these cards that are printed today uh, do have so many defects. Uh, and they they shouldn't. They really shouldn't. All right. So um, oh the other thing too. Um, I, I uh, as much as I enjoy these cards, I don't think that they're going to be worth a whole lot in 20 years from now. And and it's obviously something that I've I've discussed in the in the past. But um, if you look at the cards that say I, I may have collected as a kid in the 1980s and the early 90s, um, if you look at a Beckett and you see what the prices were uh, going for then. And you see what the prices are for the same card now, uh, 25, 30 years later. Uh, oh man, I feel old when I say that. Uh, they're they're definitely not being collected, and it's a generational uh, thing as well. And uh, I'll I'll probably get into that uh, later on. But um, I'm obviously from a different generation that say Dakota is from, and uh, he's collecting different things then uh, say my generation is collecting and the values are not going to be there. And, and the cards that are being printed now, such as this and uh, the Cabrera here, uh, that might be a little bit different, but um, these cards, uh, the 20 years from now, you know, these cards could be uh, what the 1980s cards are, are going for now. So just keep that in mind. Um, it, it obviously is a generational hobby as well. Um, and, and I, I will get to that. Uh, I, I do really kind of want to talk to you guys about this particular card, um, and the historical significance behind it. So, uh, this is Eddie Seacott. Uh, I believe he came up with the uh, Detroit Tigers and then, um, he's really kind of well known more so than the, um, than on the Red Sox. Uh, I, I didn't really know that he was on the Red Sox um, when I did find this card. I've had this card since I was a teenager. It's um, It's been in my collection for a long time. And I do have uh, a card of uh, Chick Gandal as well from uh, the T206 set. Um, it, it's it's not in, in really very good condition. I, I'd say maybe a very good plus. But uh, you can see on the back there here, uh, there's a, a nice bit of paper loss, but I got it at auction and I got it pretty cheap. Um, what I was reading about with the White Sox and uh, the, the 1919 White Sox in particular and Eddie Seacott here is, uh, 
is kind of surprised. It's, it's not surprising, but it makes me kind of angry uh, even t today because I think uh, out of the eight ball players associated with the the Black Sox, one in particular really uh, got it, it, the shaft, and and that that is Buck Weaver. Um, before I get into Buck Weaver, um, th this card is uh, is is really interesting because you know when I when I see this card, I'm not just seeing the ball player, and I'm not just seeing the design, which is a fantastic design. It's, it's one of my favorite sets, the T205, uh, and and Eddie Seacott is uh, really one of the the ball players that it, had he not actually. Uh, thrown the series, he probably would have gotten in the Hall of Fame. And I think there's other um, players on the uh, Black Sox that would have gotten in the Hall of Fame other than Joe Jack, uh, Joe Jackson, Shoeless Joe. Um, I think Hap Happy Felch would have gotten in the Hall of Fame. And I definitely think that Buck Weaver would have gotten in the Hall of Fame as well. Uh, he's a ball player, Weaver is, that uh, got better with uh, age. And time and his statistics bear this out. Um, obviously, these guys are playing in the dead ball era, and you can't compare the dead ball era with the live ball era ball players. Uh, it just it just doesn't work. It's just, there's too many differences uh, in style and play and um, the equipment as well, uh, such as the baseball. Now, um, as far as Buck Weaver is concerned. Um, I, I really think that uh, he was uh, deceived. He is a ball player that really needs to have a closer look at. And, and baseball really kind of has refused to do this. He's not the only ball player that I would look at for uh, consideration uh, back into baseball. Uh, you have you have a few other ball players uh, in in um, in particular that that are you know Buck Weaver types, and what I mean by that is uh, is uh, as I go f uh, and tell you the story of Buck Weaver, <laughs> you're gonna notice similarities uh, in that of uh, Eddie Fisher um, and uh, Benny Koff as well. Those two players they need their cases to be looked at again. Um, in the case of Eddie Fisher, he was a Red Sox. I'm mean, sorry, the the Reds, Cincinnati Reds pitcher. Uh, about the same time uh, that the Black Sox were, uh, you know, fixing games, he was pitching for the, the Reds, and he uh, he contract jumped. But maybe we're not entirely sure what happened, and I don't think anybody can really tell you what happened. Uh, the Reds. Uh, owner Jerry Herman and the uh, manager Pat Moran uh, gave him the okay to visit uh, a college uh, in the in the off season and, and specifically put him on the in, the inactive uh, list and uh, that didn't occur so he thought that he was okay and uh, when he came back to the team he finds that he's uh, not only uh, in an active ball player, but he's also banned from baseball. And um, I, 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 uh, I think that that uh, needs to be looked at again. And then Benny Koff, obviously, a very flashy ball player, very good ball player. Uh, I've known of him being a star in the uh, Federal League, 1914, 1915. And uh, he, he was a flashy ball player on and off the field. Uh, you know, he, he'd be dressed to the nines and, uh, you know, loaded with jewelry, right? And uh, he goes and steals a car. Now, why would you do that? And uh, if you're making all this kind of money, there's no reason to be stealing cars. And uh, it, it's been said that it was actually his brother that stole the car. Uh, he had nothing really to do with it. And there's some other aspects of that uh, case as well that need to be reopened and examined. Uh, hopefully that can happen. I, and I think maybe the case of Buck Weaver really needs to be looked at. Um, Buck Weaver was a really good ball player. And 
he was at the same meeting with the gamblers and um, he really kind of, I don't think, had much of a choice uh, to go along with it. He didn't take any money, but he knew about what was going on. And um, he's not the only ball player that knew uh, there was a fix before the World Series. The problem for Weaver is that he's he's my build. He's about 150 pounds. He, he's about five foot seven, five foot nine, and uh, Chick Gandel and Swede Riseberg are not. Those guys would have uh, probably uh, hurt him, and uh, they were they were physically much bigger than um, Weaver was, and uh, you can you can see where the physicality would have come into play, especially when you're dealing with uh, guys like Abe Attell and Billy Marg, who are boxers as well. And then you have the um, the, the gambler aspect and uh, probably even, I mean, we know Arnold Rothstein uh, was involved with the mafia and, uh, you know, you have a mafia connection to this as well. And, uh, you know, $100,000. What was $100,000 uh, in, in uh, 1919? Uh, you know, I haven't really looked at what the conversion rate would be in, in 2022, but uh, it's, you know, probably probably over a million dollars or something like that, something crazy. So um, there would have probably not been any ample uh, chance for Weaver to have uh, gone to either say Ben Johnson or Charles Comiskey uh, and and say hey listen like this is what's going on uh, he may have uh, been more concerned for his safety than uh, anything else and, and not been in a position to really say anything especially with the other guys uh, as well you know they he could have been threatened. And it, most likely, I think he was threatened. In fact, um, Weaver uh, was uh, the first person to uh, to go to Landis, Commissioner Landis, and say, I I'm innocent. I, I have nothing to do with this. And uh, I think the both of them, Landis and, and uh, Comiskey, have a lot to do. They have a lot of, ex you know, to answer for um, in, in all of this, especially Comiskey, I think. Uh, Landis had, had said earlier, really, no, I think it's Comiskey who said to, to Weaver, if, if you're found innocent, you will be reinstated back into the club. And um, that I don't think was uh, a promise that was given to any other ball player. You had another ball player uh, by the name of uh, Joe Gideon, who is, I believe, a second baseman for the St. Louis Browns who profited off of knowledge from uh, the the um, fix. And he's also banned from baseball. I don't really have much of a problem with that at all. However, what I kind of do have a problem with all of this is uh, when you're banned from life, uh, whose life are you banned from? I mean, you're, these guys are already dead. Uh, you know, Seacott died in, I believe, 1969. And all, everybody involved is now dead. Why are they still banned from baseball? Especially Buck Weaver. Um, Buck Weaver, again, he didn't take any money. He knew about it. Landis said a day after uh, they were acquitted, um, in I believe August 21, uh, 1921, uh, that, um, you know, you you guys are now banned from baseball for life, and and uh, Landis to me is very outlandish. He's a very outlandish person. There's there's several issues with with both Landis and Comiskey that I personally do not like. I would have banned Charles Comiskey if I were Landis, but Landis ended up looking the other way when it came to Charles Comiskey's behavior. Uh, leading up to um, the fix. And I think he's got a, a lot to do with the fix itself. Uh, Comiskey uh, was a big time gambler. Uh, he he basically mortgaged his, his stadium 
uh, to, I believe, pay off debts. He was, I believe, heavily in debt to uh, to to uh, bookies at the time, and um, he's one of the reasons why a lot of these ball players ended up uh, going along with the fix. Uh, th there's certain cases where Comiskey did pay out a lot of money uh, for ball players. Uh, Smeed Jolly comes to mind, but uh, I think he paid. I think he paid him like 50 grand, Smee Jolly, back in the 1920s. But um, he, he was notoriously cheap. And, and he's not hes not the only guy who was pretty cheap at the time as an owner. Um, Connie Mack as well. And uh, Connie Mack, uh, unlike a lot of uh, owners, uh, he didn't have any other business to fall on. So like Jacob Rupert had his, uh, his brewery. And I think there was a few other guys, uh, like Phil Ball. Uh, Phil Ball had uh, another business on the side that um, he could rely on. Uh, I, I think Phil Ball was actually a manufacturer, and he was the owner of, I think, the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, anyway, uh, if he wasn't the owner of the Phillies, he was the owner of the Browns. I, I get some of these owners are really kind of confused. Anyway. Um, the, uh, the thing with, um, Landis was that, uh, he was going to be, he threw, well, he at least was threatened to have been thrown off the bench, uh, as a judge because a lot of his, um, decisions on the bench were really overturned, especially his decisions during World War One, uh, in regards to, um, I guess uh, what he thought maybe have been uh, people with German descent, uh, you know, not not having um, the same rights as other Americans. And um, this is really where uh, Woodrow Wilson's administration goes off the rails. Um, and um, Wilson is really, he's not my favorite president at all. I don't like the guy. Uh, I don't pretend to like him either. Uh, and I know my my job as a reporter, as a journalist, is to uh, look at things fairly balanced, straight down the middle, and that can be really tough. Uh, it'd be really tough because uh, obviously of of ideology and and, and the, your belief systems and and you know in, in the case of uh, Woodrow Wilson, I I don't like the guy, um, and but I, I try to uh, to remain impartial and, and it's it's it is difficult it is difficult you got just such an ass hat um that that it's um it, it's i don't see any any saving grace for woodrow wilson and uh i'm not the only one either uh you know i think yale is is trying to get rid of his uh his, any any memory of him uh being from yale i i don't think that's right either by the way um, you, you need to own up to your history and, and you need to, instead of, uh, trying to, un, uh, or cover it up and uncover it and, uh, basically tell people why these things are important and what was going on, um, in, in, uh, other parts of America at any given time. And the thing is baseball it mirrors America at any given era uh, in time. And, and that's why it is an important sport. And and the, and the thing is, um, you can learn a lot from baseball cards just if you understand that baseball mirrors America. And and the one thing is, you know, when I look at this, I'm not just looking at the ball player or the art, the awesome artwork, I should say, um, but I'm also looking at what's going on in America at the time. And uh, in this case. You know, when I, when I, I'm sorry about the birds, by the way, back there, they, I told them, you know, guys be quiet, please, but they have like hearing problems or something. Anyway, um, when I look at the back of this card, and you can see that the factory number and the district number uh, on the back of a lot of your tobacco cards. And uh, I, I've kind of tried to show you guys in uh, my, my written work. Uh, exactly why that is and, and how that came to be. And uh, it actually has a lot to do with the uh, the way that 
the country went after uh, taxes. So there was no income tax prior to February of 1913. And instead, the, um, the way that Uncle Sam um, got revenue was through the sin taxes, such as your tobacco and your alcohol and then your tariffs as well. And uh, I believe it was through the uh, tariff of, um, I think, 1894, uh, in which you first see uh, the the use of your uh, your factory. And this is factory number 60 from New York. Not exactly sure where that is. Uh, I think it's New York City. Uh, the one thing that uh, these don't do very well is tell you exactly where they are in the state. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thing nonetheless. And uh, there's a lot of uh, financial information that you can glean from these cards. Uh, the, the one thing that a lot of people might not know or understand is, is that uh, tobacco cards were born through legislation and they died through legislation as well. And um, the, the one thing I, I try not to, in fact, I, I never talk about modern uh, or current politics. Uh, that is just for me and, and same with my religion. Uh, but I, I will talk uh, a lot about uh, the politics of the day in which the card was issued. And uh, in, in some cases, it, it is vitally important to the discussion of the card set uh, and whatever legislation uh, led to uh, either a short printed card um, or a card um, being able to uh, be printed, such as the T206. And um, I, I, uh, I will get into those aspects because uh, honestly, it's, it's a part of history. And I know that a lot of people are, are really uh, trying to escape politics, and uh, as I am too, I, I don't like to talk about politics. I, I, I'd i rather kind of avoid it, but unfortunately I can't because it is a, an integral part of the history of the hobby and the card production. Um, so uh, that, that, is, that is kind of unfortunate, really. Um, I, I, uh, I try to keep things fair and balanced even, even then. The thing is, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, cards that are over 100 years old and uh, society in, say, the 1910s, uh, when Teddy Roosevelt or uh, Woodrow Wilson or uh, William Howard Taft were, were alive, the country was a lot different. And I, I try to tell people uh, it's, it's kind of like if you had a, a, a flying DeLorean that could travel back in time and, and you stepped back in, say, 1913, uh, it would pre pretty much be like stepping stepping into a, um, uh, a a different planet altogether. All it would be everything would be foreign to you. Uh, the technology uh, obviously uh, would be different. Uh, it would be a, I think a, a a deep culture shock um, if you were to actually be able to step back in time. Now I, I just read somewhere uh, that time. Uh, has been they've caught time flowing backwards and uh that that is not really a shock to me really um because if, if time flows forwards it can flow backwards as well and now you're getting into uh physics and quantum mechanics uh which was not a part of this <laughs> but um i uh i also wanted to show you <laughs> some of the other <coughs> excuse me I also wanted to show you some of the other pickups I had as well. Uh, and, and the other thing about uh, Buck Weaver too is that um, he, and this is very important by the way, he uh, successfully sued for his 1921, or his 1920 salary. Um, and that tells me that he actually uh, not only did he win his case, but he was telling the truth and that um, people found him, him innocent of all charges. It also tells me that if he had, if he won his case to get his salary from Comiskey, he did sue Comiskey. And uh, I haven't seen uh, 
I really haven't seen you know any paperwork on that, uh, any legal uh, paperwork. I, I've I've tried to to find that, and he uh, he tried to uh, be reinstated about six times, uh, and each time he was denied. And, and this is um, really very fascinating, at least to me. Um, Abatel and Billy Mark both said that he was innocent of all charges, uh, even in testimony uh, under oath. And um, Ray Schalk, who was one of the first uh, White Sox players to go to Comiskey, he said there were seven ball players, not eight. The only reason why um, uh, Buck Weaver was, uh, his name was even mentioned was because of Billy Marg. And, um, you know, uh, Ray Shock said he's not involved. Uh, he's like, what are you doing? So um, I, I really think that he needs to be uh, reinstated. And, and um, I, I know his family members have tried to get him reinstated as well. Uh, it, it really seemed to me to be a injustice. Now, um, you know, growing up, uh, I used to watch the the movie Field of Dreams, and it is a great movie. It really is. Um, there's a lot of different uh, little aspects to that movie aside from baseball. It's it's a story that branches out. Um, in one instance, you really have a story of a father trying to uh, reconnect uh, or with his son, and and so uh, that's it's it's a wonderful story from that aspect. And then you have uh, in the other portion of it, which has to do with Joe Jackson. And um, when they both merge, it, it becomes a, a fantastic story um, that, you know, everybody can relate to maybe at, at some level um, because it, it is baseball and it is family. Um, and, and so uh, Joe Jackson, uh, is portrayed in, in the story, I think, as, as, as a sympathetic character. And uh, it's the only part of the story which I, I really don't agree with. Um, because uh, Buck Weaver was able to successfully gain his, uh, his salary from Comiskey, um, Joe Jackson attempted to do the same thing. Uh, in, I think, 1923 or 1924, and I think this case was settled in 1925. How, however, uh, there's a huge difference here between the two ball players, um, and, and that is that uh, Joe Jackson lied under oath. He he um, was actually sent to jail, and he wasn't the only one either. I, I believe I wrote down oh another another uh, another two um, sports writers also got into this uh, case as well. Anyway, uh, yeah. Well, so Abe Tell tried to uh, to get um, Buck Weaver reinstated, uh, I think at least once or twice, and Damon Runyon as well. And, and a lot of people don't uh, maybe understand or have uh, been told that Damon Runyon is one of the, the sports writers who uh, was involved in. Uh, Finding out um, about these these ball players uh, fixing the World Series, and he also uh, was uh, a, a ghostwriter for um, a lot of the 1934 and 1933 Gaudi sets as, as well. Um, and he, he's uh, he, he's a he's a baseball writer, which a lot of people um, may not realize. Uh, I, I I read a lot of Damon Runyon when I was a kid, and uh, I didn't I didn't know that about Damon Runyon. Uh, ho however, um, the attorney for Weaver uh, was a guy named uh, Benedict J. Short, and I think he also uh, was Joe Jackson's attorney as well. Uh, Joe Jackson was um, he he was really functionally illiterate. Uh, he couldn't read and he couldn't write. And a lot of people would say that uh, he was taken advantage of by everybody. And I think that's really kind of true to a certain extent. Uh, he, he depended on his wife uh, for a lot of business decisions. 
And uh, I'm sure he didn't tell her about uh, the gamblers going to uh, pay him a visit. But um, he, he did lose his case. And uh, I believe uh, Happy Felch uh, was the other ball player uh, who was, um, and I didn't write this down. I don't know why, but something tells me that Happy Felch uh, also uh, tried to get his salary. And he was jailed, too, for perjury. So both of these guys uh, ended up in jail for a short time uh, because they perjured themselves. The uh, the testimony from the 1921 uh, trial, um, a, a lot of it was pieced together for the 1924 trial. And uh, at least I think it's 1924. Um, SABR has done a really great job in uh, piecing together uh, what happened to the Black Sox and uh, other aspects of the trial and of the fix and, and the players themselves. And uh, the one thing about SABR and um, Professional Football Researchers Association is that these guys are probably the best that I've ever seen as far as uh, in-depth invest investigative reporting and uh, trying to uh, root out a, a lot of the misconceptions, uh, especially with SABR, of the 1919 World Series uh, fix. And uh, I'm actually doing a, an article on the uh, the Cincinnati Reds uh, portion of that uh, World Series. I think that uh, it, it may have actually been a different outcome uh, for other reasons. Um, had uh, basically you had, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a, a teaser here, uh, Judge Landis uh, was almost killed, and um, there was a bomb, uh, and, and I'm going to leave you with that, but this could have had a, a very different outcome uh, had that bomb gone off, and uh, what basically occurred in the country at, at the time in uh you know, between 1910 and 1920, uh, especially, it was uh, not a very good time in American history. I'll uh, just put it, put it that way. Uh, Landis himself, uh, I would have, I would have thrown him out of baseball. Um, to tell you the truth, uh, and and uh, he, he really has no place in, in baseball. I, I don't like the guy. Uh, he he. Um, he is a, uh, a judge that was at the right place at the right time. And, and um, he has a lot of political connections going back to Teddy Roosevelt, who first instituted him uh, as a judge back in 1905. He has a card from 1929, I think called Men of the Moment uh, or Men of America. It's kind of like a, um, a booklet. Uh, but they consider it a card. It's from. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how you would uh, define this set. In fact, I'm not sure how uh, Jefferson Burdick defined it. Um, and, and so uh, I'll probably be talking about uh, those uh, cards, if you will. I'm not even sure that they're cards, to tell you the truth, uh, what they are. Uh, there is a set that's somewhat similar from 1888 uh, from Duke and Co. Uh, of Civil War generals, the 1888 set of the Poor Boys is basically um, uh, a set that consisted of uh, gentlemen and ladies who um, were really poor growing up, and they uh, became wealthy, or very rich, and uh, it's similar to that set, the uh, the, the 1929 set. Uh, however, um, I, again, I am not a fan of of uh, Comiskey or or um, Woodrow Wilson or um, you know uh, you know Teddy Roosevelt. I, these these guys, they're historical figures, and and uh, I, I look at them through historical lenses. You shouldn't at least um, look at uh, what they did in in their time with uh, what is um, you know going on today. Uh, with um, you know, our our senses, um, and, and so it's, it's not it's it's something you can't do. I, you know you can't have 
um, a, a historical person um, and, and have your own uh, sense of right and wrong and apply it to a different generation. It's just, it, it does not work at all. And, uh, and, you know, as I've said in the past, um, you really need to show history for what it is and teach it. Um, because once it's, it's gone, it's going to be up to other generations to uncover this stuff. And this is something that I, I know I've told you guys in the past that, um, I, I have, uh, really kind of uncovered, um, hobby history that has been missing are not taught in the hobby. Uh, and, and this is stuff that goes back, you know, pre, uh, Burdick. So, you know, Jefferson Burdick started the hobby, founded the American hobby in, uh, 1935 through a uh, hobbies magazine. And, uh, that that's how we get the hobby, but the hobby is actually around a lot longer and it's founded, um, in, in, England in 1927. Um, <laughs> how, how collectors actually, um, you know, collected cards and, and um, you know, traded and all that prior to 1935 is really kind of, it's fascinating to me. There's a few articles on card collecting prior to 1935, specifically one from 1929. Uh, you have a, a few instances of uh, collectors placing ads in um, magazines and newspapers, uh, asking other collectors for cards. Um, but there's no real uh, instance of a, um, a, a documented value of any of these cards and what you should be paying for them um, up and through, I think, 1937. And then uh, definitely by uh, 1939, uh, Jefferson Burdick comes out with his uh, American card catalog. Actually, it's the U.S. card catalog until I think 1930. I'm sorry, 1946. Uh, he he changes several uh, things about his card catalog. Uh, Jefferson Burdick is, is really an intelligent uh, person, and um, he's he. Uh, if it's up to me, I'm, I'm putting his mug on a stamp. <laughs> it's just, you know, um, we can learn a lot from uh, the, the past hobby. Uh, the problem is, is uh, it's the same problem that I'm, I'm noticing in uh, newspapers is that um, the digitization process is uh, not quite there. Uh, we don't have everything digitized in the newspaper. Um, industry and uh i i know that a lot more newspapers i, I believe uh now are uh, just digitized only but um there's a huge chunk of hobby history that's missing and um I, i'm trying to do my best to tell you guys about the hobby history and uh, what we can learn from that uh, going forward and um it's not easy some of the stuff is just it's, it's not found it's not digitized at all and uh we get kind of you know pieces of of hobby history uh through through burdick's own um his own writings and uh it's it's something that that's really kind of i don't know frustrating as for me uh, as a researcher and a writer I always viewed card shows as interactive classrooms. And uh, one of the things I really enjoy about going to shows is the fact that I, I never know who I'm going to meet, uh, either new dealers or uh, new collectors, and uh, really kind of uh, talk to them and see what's going on in the hobby. And uh, one gentleman in particular that uh, I found very impressive at the Altman show was... Um, Darren Chandler and uh, Darren has a really interesting uh, I guess inventory of vintage football and uh, he, he really knows his football as well so uh, I enjoyed uh, what he had to say and uh, I did pick up a couple of cards from him 
Uh, he's a very fair dealer and he, he really knows his stuff. So uh, if you guys are actually looking to pick up some vintage, uh, you might want to give him a, uh, a contact and, and see what he can do for you. Um, the card that I did pick up, actually I picked up two cards. I'm just going to show one right now. Um, I, I did pick up, uh, well, I picked up this card right here. It is a 1968 Topps Paul Warfield. And uh, I wanted to add this particular card in my set, uh, in my collection. Um, and I did see his rookie card there, um, but uh, sometimes really it's a particular card that I'm looking for uh, from either uh, a design aspect or uh, something that happened in the player's career uh, in, a, in a year. And uh, another example of this would be uh, Jack Butler here. And this is from the 1959 Topps uh, football set. And I did a, a pretty lengthy article on this set. Now, I, I don't like Jack Butler's rookie card from the 1957 Topps set. I don't like 1957 Topps football. And uh, I don't like the design. It's a design that actually came from Bowman, um, and it was supposed to be for their upcoming uh, baseball set. And uh, usually what Bowman would do is they would go to other cities like, uh, say, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, maybe even Los Angeles, and they would uh, show their mock-ups to groups of kids uh, in order to figure out what they might want. And then they'd, they'd go back and they'd tally up um, all the, the, uh, the, the you know, yeses and noes for, I guess, certain uh, card designs. And that would be the design that they would use uh, for their upcoming sets. And so uh, Bowman actually uh, had to sell out to Tops in February of 1956 for $200,000. And... Um, a part of that uh, agreement was that um, everything that Bowman had uh, design-wise uh, went to Tops, and so you see a lot of uh, the uh, designs that Tops had were actually Bowman designs uh, that they never got to use. And uh, in one case, uh, Hires root beer, uh, their 1958 to uh, baseball set was actually a Bowman design. Um, so I, I thought that was really kind of interesting. Um, the, uh, the the Jack Butler here I just showed you that I, I do really enjoy the 1959 Topps uh, set for football. And uh, it, it is one of my favorite designs. And uh, it, it actually kind of shows you um, a, a classic mid-century modern design, a very crisp and clean set. And uh, the, the design itself actually goes back to 1920s Buhaus School of Design uh, from Germany. And uh, a lot of your, your baseball, football, basketball, hockey uh, cards from the mid-1950s through, I believe, until 1970 actually exhibit uh, a lot of this design aspects from uh, Germany. And a lot of their designers uh, were forced to flee Nazi Germany, and they ended up in either New York or Chicago, um, and, and they continued to teach other artists and designers. And um, that made its way into everything from furniture to uh, architecture and into sports cards. And it's it's clearly um, evident in in at least the 1959 uh, football set uh, and uh, um, your 1955 B Bowman as well. Although I think that's a, um, an amalgamation of other uh, things going on in the 1950s as well. H however, um, design is really important, uh, like I said earlier, to a, a card's um, future and uh, the, the, the company's future as well. Uh, a, a good design obviously can make or break um, a, a, uh, a company or a set or even the, uh, the photo itself. 
Um, <laughs> there are other cards I did pick up um, specifically uh, because of what was going on around the card. And um, let me show you two of them. Um, so here we go. Uh, the 1968 uh, Topps baseball set. And uh, actually, what you're going to notice here is that white line. Um, this is actually a 1968 Topps Milton Bradley card. And uh, it, it's um, it, it's really kind of a, an interesting thing. I also grabbed uh, a Tony Oliva as well, and he just got in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and and uh, I really kind of wanted something of, of his. Uh, and some of his cards are still pretty cheap. There are ball players who uh, get in the Hall of Fame and their rookie cards are really expensive, uh, such as uh, Bobby Dillon um, and, and uh, his 1952 uh, Bowman football uh, rookie is really expensive. And, um, this isn't the case for, I think, uh, some of your baseball, uh, but it is in a lot of cases, your uh, your football cards, especially from the 1950s and uh, 1960s, um, are, are uh, very affordable. And if you were going to go into vintage football, um, you might want to start out uh, from the late 1950s. Um, they are affordable, and uh, in a lot of cases, you can pick up a Hall of Famers very cheap. Uh, now, one of the interesting things about the card I just showed you um, was, you know, this card right here, was that uh, at the same time, you're also seeing uh, this set as well, and this is a 1967 Topps football uh, card of Joe Namath and uh, Chris from Stories and Cardboard just did a fantastic uh, video of Joe Namath which <clears throat> you guys can go over to his site and check that video out and give him a like and subscribe um, because I, I really I really enjoyed that and <clears throat> this card in particular was a card that I've been looking for for essentially my entire collecting career uh if you know again uh, a collecting career is kind of interesting uh, but um I, I really enjoy the design of this card and uh the photo the photography itself um what you're going to notice uh in the milton bradley set uh is is pretty pretty much the same thing that you're going to notice with the Kurt Flood I just showed you, the Tony Oliva, except on the bottom and the top, you're going to see the uh, the very edge of uh, this card right here. And um, there's something else that is uh, interesting too, uh, and which is why I, I showed you the Joe Namath, is that um, if you guys can see this, uh, the back is a little bit different uh, color-wise. Uh, I believe um, the way you can tell um, a, a lot of the Milton Bradley cards is by the coloration of uh, the, the back. Uh, if you can't find a card that has the, uh, the, the trimmed portion of the 1968 baseball set, uh, that's the other option that you can tell by the back. But um, what I usually try and try to do, because it, um, sometimes it's it's even for me, it's really kind of difficult to to find out these things um, or to tell. I'll take a photograph, and, and a lot of times when I go to shows, I, I am uh, taking a notebook with me. I'm taking a lot of notes, taking photographs of the cards, and I'm talking to the dealers. And um, it, it all kind of uh, uh, is for uh, later investigation, um, just in case, because you never know what you're going to come across. And, and a lot of times my notes, I'm, I'm flipping through them and, and saying, okay, do I have this card? 
um, or like what are the uh, telltale signs uh, of this particular card that I should be looking at uh, or for. And uh, in particular, uh, um, right off the bat, um, the 1960 Tops uh, of Frank Gifford is a card that um, always kind of is in the back of my mind. Uh, what the flaws are of that card, and every card has their particular flaws and their their particular pluses and minuses um, of it. And, and I just kind of showed you that with the uh, the 1968 tops um, Milton Bradley cards, you are going to see a, a lot of these cards that, that are um, going to have this, and uh, I, I don't know how graders um, uh, kind of look at that and, and give a grade, a proper grade to, uh, just because that is something that I want to see on that particular card, or the line uh, either. I think there's a, um, a sports car card uh, attached to that particular um, board game. And then there's also uh, a Parker Brothers game from 1974 that also issued a 1974 Tops cards, uh, according to Darren. And uh, he was telling me that uh, some ball players, football players, actually have uh, a different image associated with it. And uh, there's a few Hall of Famers in that set. Um, it's not my favorite set, um, but it's it's a really interesting uh, card and it's a, and a really, a, you know, when you come going to the 1968 uh, Topps baseball set, 1968 is a uh, a, a year that is um, really kind of a, a seminal year for America and uh, baseball in, in general. I, I'm not a particular fan of uh, the design overall, the burlap, I think it's kind of awful in a, a good looking way. And uh, there's an also another um, very similar uh, design set that Topps did um, down in Venezuela uh, in 1968 as well. And, and actually the Venezuelan Topps cards are very popular. I don't have any with me right here, but uh, it's actually a cloth card. And uh, I believe uh, they started out in 1959 and it's actually half of the regular set. Um, so you could be ending up with uh, maybe uh, less than 300 cards per uh, set uh, from Venezuela. And um, there are, you know, 1968 Tops Venezuelan, uh, Johnny Bench rookie, and your Nolan Ryan as well. And I believe Nolan Ryan is also found in this set too. The, uh, Milton Bradley set, um, and uh, those those cards are uh, the Venezuelan especially are um, pretty beat up. Uh, you, you're not going to find those cards in, in any decent collector grade. Uh, very very few of them will be, and that's because of the humidity and the fact that uh, the company issued them with. Uh, um, you know, a, a fabric, and, and so fabric is going to break down pretty easily, uh, especially if, if it's being handled by uh, a kid. But uh, the Venezuelan cards uh, were not issued every year. I don't believe that there's a 1961 Tops Venezuela. There's 1960, there's 1962. I, I have never seen a 1963 Tops Venezuelan. I don't think that actually exists. Uh, 1964. I'm not sure about 1965, uh, 1966, there's definitely 1967, and then the final year, 1968, which I think is probably the most popular. Uh, and and they're, they're actually a little bit different. Most most of those cards on the back, uh, for instance, I will show you. Uh, these right here, they're going to say printed in the U.S. and uh, TCG, Tops Card, uh, Think gum company anyway, uh, that's going to be replaced by uh, Venezuela, right? So, um, and it's going to be in Spanish. 
uh, you um, you're not going to see uh, the same uh, color on the back of the 1964 Venezuelan tops cards. They're going to be black, and I think um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think at least one other issue is in, a, in a, a different color as well on the back and i think it's um a a magenta or a dark red and i can't off the top of my head remember exactly what that is but um they're they're you know not all of them are very expensive the 64s you can get pretty cheap uh the 68s I, 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 i'm really saying that they're kind of expensive these days especially uh, the the um, Nolan Ryan rookie, and I'm I think that uh, I want to say that Johnny Bench also is included in that '68 Venezuelan set as well. Uh, Johnny Bench's rookie is is quite nice. I'm not a, a fan of Ryan rookie. I, I'd rather have his 1969, and a lot of collectors actually consider um, the first. Uh, solo photo of uh, Nolan Ryan or some of the other ball players to be their actual rookie cards. I, I don't consider that at all. Um, there are uh, cards of, of ball players, um, specifically like um, Yogi Berra and Phil Rizzuto and um, Sammy Baugh that uh, have cards prior to their national card issuance. So, uh, for example, um, the 1948 Bowman Sammy Baugh is not his rookie card. His rookie card is in the 1938 Dixie Lid Premium set. And um, he does have cards uh, or matchbook covers from 1939 through 1942. Uh, same thing uh, with um, Yogi Berra has a 1947 tip top red card, which is his actual rookie card. And uh, Phil Rizzuto is in the 1941 double play set. So his rookie card is not actually the 1948 Bowman card. Um, and, and again, um, that... Uh, a lot of collectors don't like to hear that because uh, they may have uh, these cards already and a lot of money wrapped up in them. Uh, and, and for financial reasons, uh, they would rather say that it, it is their rookie. And I really kind of blame uh, uh, Beckett for this kind of stuff. Um, a lot of emphasis has been placed on rookie cards uh, over the last 40 years because of Beckett. Uh, I do like Beckett. I, I love the magazine. Um, it is a part of my childhood, but there are certain things that they really kind of um, screwed up on. And uh, in my estimation, the um, the emphasis on rookies. Uh, I, I understand that um, rookie cards are, are an important thing for uh, kids and collectors. Uh, and um, I understand that, but uh, it is not always the case that you're going to find a a card of a or ball player's rookie card being an, an actual rookie card. Now, um, when, when I look at a card like this, uh, you know Jose Canseco has other rookie cards, so you can have multiple rookie cards of the player. In the same year, um, Hank Greenberg, the same way. I think he has four or five different rookie cards. His 1934 Gaudi is considered his rookie card, but he has four other cards from 1934. Uh, in any event, uh, th this card right here is, is a card that I always wanted in my collection. Uh, I had to, to um, basically get it again because the first card, that I had, I got uh, on my birthday and it just magically disappeared. Uh, it was at the time a $90 card. And um, you can see what uh, it's worth today, which is not $90 at, at all. I think I paid $20 for this card autographed. 
And, uh, you know, again, Jose Canseco's uh, card here is is really interesting uh, because it, it is a classic card. Um, the design is classic as well. Uh, you know, when I see this card, I immediately think 1980s. And, and um, again, I, I can't tell the difference between cards today and from what decade. So um, another card I picked up too is... Uh, this this card, this is a 1951 Topps ringside. I love boxing. I, I always have, uh, not just as a, a collector, but, you know, as a sport. And um, it's uh, Jersey Joe Walcott, obviously Hall of Famer. And he's got at least two cards in this set. And the funny thing about uh, this set compared to the baseball set was, the baseball set was uh, uh, part of a, a game, and um, I'm not entirely familiar with that game, per se. Uh, the design, I do really enjoy the 1951 uh, Topps blue back and red back design, and uh, I, I think it was a failure, uh, especially, I think it came with, um, I think it came with, like, t taffy or something like that, or uh, toffee or whatever. The candy that it came with really sucked. Uh, however, the the design itself um, is, I think, a really nice design. And um, it, it, if it was actually um, something where they, they could have lithographed it, like the um, ringside set here, I think it would be a much popular card set. Um, this this set, if you were going to collect um, any 1950s, 40s, 30s, or, or even 1910s boxing, uh, you might want to go for this set. This is it is a really nice set. A lot of Hall of Famers in it that are fairly cheap. Boxing is actually a it's a niche uh, sport, but it has a huge cult following, and uh, and and grab these cards fairly cheap. I'll be talking more about boxing in the future and, and the players or the, or the boxers, I should say, and, and the, the cards themselves. But um, it, there are rarities in the 1951 ringside set. And uh, one of those is uh, Irish Bob Murphy. Um, he is um, not a, uh, a guy that most people would remember today. But um, his card in that set is a short print. It is a key card. Um, he didn't really have much of a distinguished career. You you have Joe Lewis in that set. Uh, Joey Maxim. You have just a lot of Hall of Famers. Uh, the Rocky Marciano in this in that set is um, one of I think three Marciano cards. Uh, a lot of people say that that's his rookie card. I think he actually has a card from 1948. Um, but it is, again, a key card in that set. And it is really nice. I actually picked up that card in good condition several years ago. Uh, and I think I think I paid maybe a little under 100 bucks. Uh, however, um, it, it is an expensive card. And... Um, that's where I, I kind of want to uh, drift a little bit towards. Some of these cards are just so exorbitantly expensive that you're going to have to purchase them when you can uh, and at the condition that you can afford. And um, it, it's okay, depending on the card that you do this. Um, don't always think that you have to go for the top shelf cards and uh, the top shelf ball players. I actually um, have to pick up cards when I can uh, and, and for what condition. Um, so in my collection, I am I am not Lionel Carter. I'm not going for the top shelf card. Uh, you know, Lionel Carter is, is very notorious for uh, having cards in near mint, mint condition. However, um, he also had cards that had uh, creases in them and just, you know, beat condition. Uh, I actually happen to think that a lot of Lionel Carter's cards uh, in, in off condition, especially your tobacco cards, 
were given to him by John D. Wagner. Um, and, I, you know, can I prove it? No. But uh, it, it is uh, kind of unusual for a guy who uh, has a lot of cards in such amazing condition to have other cards in uh, a condition that is, you know, off or are not collector grade. And um, it, it, it may be that, you know, again, he did grab a bunch of those cards from John D. Wagner. And I think he actually got those cards uh, from him because of his military service overseas. Uh, John D. Wagner is a guy, again, who is another fellow pioneer collector who was in the military. Um, and uh, he wanted to thank uh, Lionel Carter for his service. So he gave him a shoebox filled of uh, tobacco cards and whatever else. Up to that point, uh, Lionel Carter did not have tobacco cards in his collection. And that would have been in 1945 or 1946. Uh, so uh, you, anytime you see a Lionel Carter uh, collection card up for sale and it is not in uh, collector grade, that's probably most likely where uh, those cards came from. Uh, and I'm, I'm almost betting 100% that they are cards given to him by John D. Wagner. Uh, so in reality, you have a card that's probably uh, from two pioneers uh, in the hobby. Um, you know, getting back to uh, collecting cards in off condition, uh, it, it, it really is something that uh, you can maybe uh, upgrade depending on the ball player and the card. Some cards are just so rare that you're not going to be able to do that. Your your, uh, your Boston store, for example, from 1917, uh, they're they're not found. They're not always found. Um, and, and so anytime I, I find one of those, I'll, I'll pick one up. Uh, and on, yeah, okay, Boston, and that's where I'm from. But um, th those cards are actually uh, not from Boston. Uh, I believe they're from the Midwest. And, and so um, th there are cards, again, where um, the manufacturer of them uh, makes them susceptible to damage. And, and that's true with a lot of your, um, your Cuban cards. And, uh, you know, with Cuban cards, um, say like Mini Minoso, for example, his rookie card is actually a Cuban issue. Uh, but, you know, again, um, the um, the Cuban issues are, are really kind of uh, a niche uh, item, really, and, and something that um, I, I do enjoy. I'm, I'm probably going to be talking more about those. So um, for today, guys, I, I really appreciate you guys stopping by and uh, and talking with me. And, and I really want to get your perspective on a lot of the stuff that I, I showed you today and see what you guys have to say. Um, I, I think one of the things I, I really enjoy, probably uh, equal to uh, showing you guys cards and and um, talking about them is, is to hear what you guys ha have to say about it. And the other thing too is I I'm always around um, to help you guys out uh, with your collecting uh, needs and habits and any of your questions uh, on cards. Um, uh, if, if every time I, I have a, a question about a card that I'm not familiar with, um, I'll ask a question. Uh, and and um, so I, I don't mind doing that for, for any of you guys and, and whatever whatever else uh, you guys may want to talk about. Uh, I have no problem. Just uh, leave a, a comment. And uh, my email address is also on, on my page as well. Uh, so you can go directly to my email and uh, I'll be happy to help you guys out. So uh, until the next time, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. Give a like and subscribe and I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.